Reach Young Adult Ministry Sermons online from Tuesday, February 15th, 2022 by Philip Jackson, pastor of young adults at Evergreen Baptist Church in Tulsa, Oklahoma, entitled Respect from 1 Timothy 5, 17 through 25. There is a story. Yeah, I've been throwing everybody off without the beard. It's a thing. It's funny because people keep asking Lindsay what she thinks, and she's like, we met when we were 16, so... This is kind of the face that she fell in love with, and it's the only face I've got. So, there you, yeah, somebody, did somebody go, ugh, what? What was that? Wow, it's my sister. My baby sister's like, ugh. I mean, the one that shares some of my DNA. That's interesting. Okay, cool. Um, yeah. Uh, we are, we're in a series of lessons where we're looking at, uh, what God says about, um, about leaders. We're looking at, at First Timothy. This is the year of the servant. So we're looking at how God has drawn boundaries around his, uh, his church and his community. Um, last week, we looked at widows. And I know that that might have been a little bit of a snooze fest for some of you. I'll, I'll acknowledge that because how do we deal with widows when we're young adults? Like, what does that even mean? And it's important for us to know these things because we are, as we're as we're a part of God's body of believers, as we're part of His church, that means that we're going to we're going to interact with all different kinds of people. We're going to interact with uh, with young people and old people and children and and all different walks of life, all different seasons of life. And it's important for us to remember uh, what is true. Um, very practical application for what we talked about last week was that we live in a generation that is uh, that is somehow fallen into this this idea that um, the gospel is all centered around just giving people free stuff. And it's just not. That's just not true. Uh, it's called the social gospel. That uh, there's, a, there's a really famous quote by someone way back in the day. It's kind of mixed around. It's attributed to different people. But uh, that we should share the gospel, and if need be, we should use words. Um, the problem is that uh, if all we're doing is meeting physical needs and we're never, we're never doing the really hard work of heart work, we never actually going to see people's lives changed. Um, in fact, James talks about that. He says, you're going to give people food and give them clothes and you're going to say, be warmed and filled, but, and yet you neglect to give them the truth of the gospel that will really change their life. And so I know that some of these lessons are a little dry uh, as far as where we are in our seasons of life. But there are things that we can draw from them and really good truth that can help us process things. You know, when you when you are um, confronted with that panhandler at 71st and 169 or when you're dealing with how do I how do I show compassion on people and I and I give to my resources so they can hear the gospel. How do I maturely look at those needs? So this is something that we've been that we've been learning. Tonight we're going to look at uh, the second half of First Timothy chapter five. So if you have your Bibles, turn over there. We're going to look at look at starting in verse seventeen and we're going to work to the end of the chapter. And we're going to talk about holding pastors accountable. Um, there's a lot of a lot of scripture about the church body and us holding each other accountable as brothers and sisters in Christ. But what does it mean to hold a pastor accountable? What does it mean to show true, honest respect? What does that process look like? If I, if I found myself compromised in, in, in my walk with God and I was not doing what I say that, that, I, that I believe, what does it look like for you guys to come alongside me and to confront me in love and say, hey, PJ, you're, you are not walking the walk. We're going to look at that tonight. And we're going to look at um, the responsibility, not just how we can confront pastors and how we can hold them to the standard that God has set for them, but also to, um, to understand what the cost is. You know, I, I know that, that I've spent time with many of you, and we've talked about issues in life. We've talked about decisions. We've talked about um, seasons and hard things that you guys are dealing with. And uh, one of the privileges of being your pastor is that I get the opportunity to walk through some of those things with you. Um, but if we're not careful, we isolate and we think, well, the Philip is just the guy with the answers. Or Michael is just the guy with the answers, or you fill in the blank, and we—it's uh, easy to miss the toll that's, that it takes on pastors, and why God has set them apart for a reason, for a specific purpose. So check this out. Let's start in verse 
uh, 17 of uh, 1 Timothy chapter 5. We're going to start with a respect, uh, uh, respect the call of God. Verse 17 says this. It says, The elders who rule well are to be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, You shall not muzzle the ox while he is threshing, and the laborer is worthy of his wages. Okay, let me stop right there. So the first thing I want you to see here is that those who lead well are worthy of respect and honor. Um, remember, when we looked at the, the qualifications of being an elder or being a pastor back in 1 Timothy chapter 3, we listed all of these attributes. They need to be a person of, of good reputation. They need to be someone who rules their home well. They need to be somebody who is chasing Jesus, who's been an example to the believers. All of these things about their character. And so what, Tim, what, what Paul is telling his protege Timothy here is he's saying, these people that do it well, that, that live up to the calling that God has given them, that they're worthy of double honor. There's, a, um, there's actually a, um, a subset of believers, of Christians, um, who believe that pastors should not be compensated for their work. Or that they should be bivocational, meaning that they have a job outside of their pastoring job. There are some people who say that that is actually... Uh, the, the, the appropriate way, that the, that the pastor shouldn't be a burden on the believers. But let's talk about this right here, because Paul doesn't seem to agree with that. He says that they're worthy of their hire. What he's talking about here is um, the credibility of their calling. Okay, so in Acts chapter 6, uh, as the church was continuing to grow, let me give you a little uh, context here. In Acts chapter 6, the church is beginning to grow by thousands and thousands of people daily. And so what happened is that there were, there were widows in that community that were being missed whenever the, the community would come together to get food. They would come together as a big family. They'd have a big, big meal around a table. And there were some widows that were not getting their needs met. They were missing the line and not, not able to, to get their food. And so some people brought some uh, complaints to the disciples about that. And at this point, there's a decision to make. The disciples can say, okay, well, we're just going to continue to do everything or uh, at, or we can choose some people who are qualified, who are good shepherds and good stewards of the truth, and we're going to give them the opportunity to serve the body. And so what they did is they chose seven men uh, to be set aside to essentially wait tables. And the word that was used to describe those men was diakonos, which is the where we get our word deacon. The idea is that the deacons are the ones who do the serving. These are literally table waiters who can see the practical needs of people and could go around and can help meet those needs. And the reason why they chose to do that is because the disciples, they realized that the power of God resides in his word. Okay, that's one of the principles of the Bible is that this is the silver bullet for all of our problems. And if we do anything to, to distract from the proper understanding and the teaching and the digesting of this word right here, we do it to the detriment of the church. We do it to the detriment of each other. Because what happens is that we live in a generation that distracts from true biblical truth and understanding, and we focus on the things that make us feel good about ourselves. For instance, if I spend all of my energy serving people, Makes me feel good about myself, right? But if I do that at the expense of knowing God's word, I'm starving myself. We talked about last week that we're eating empty calories. right? The idea is that we are being distracted by our much serving. There's a story about Jesus and his friends, Elizabeth and Mary, and how Elizabeth was, um, was caught, or sorry, Martha, was caught up in all of her much serving, and that she was wearing herself out. So what he's saying here is that um, this idea, this, this office of a pastor is set aside on purpose for enriching the lives of people through the word. Um, there are some people who uh, they mistakenly associate church work with false work, not real work. They look at, oh, well, you know, it must be nice where you can sit around and drink coffee and talk to people about their problems all day. And then you just get to read the Bible and then you get to talk about it. That's your job. But the reality is, is that to know, as, as Paul tells Timothy in 2 Timothy, to rightly divide the word of truth, it's actually an exhausting endeavor. 
Um, I wish I could. I wish I could convey to you the experience of chewing on God's word for a living. Because it is rewarding. It is exciting. It is. It is empowering. But it's exhausting. It's exhausting to always be working through problems and troubleshooting things and to work on what is true and what's not true. What he's saying here to Timothy is he's saying, remember, Timothy is in charge over the, the entire church at Ephesus that are, that are housed in house churches all over town. And so Timothy is in the unique uh, position where he is he's looking at all these pockets of believers and how their individual shepherds interact with them. And so he is looking at this whole system of churches, essentially. So he's so what Paul is telling Timothy here is he's saying, consider this when the church members come to you and they complain about their pastors, that they are worthy of 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 pay, that they're worthy of a double honor. Um, in uh, in Ephesians, Paul tells us that the the goal and the, the job of pastors to is to equip the saints for ministry. The idea is that Paul is reminding uh, Timothy here that it is his job to make sure that these shepherds that God has set aside are taken care of. Now consider this. Okay, if we, if we believe that uh, pastors are the ones that are supposed to do the work and everybody else is just supposed to come and rely on them to do everything, how much work is going to get done? How much, how much ministry is going to get done? How much gospel is going to be spread? The reality is they're really small. There's a mistaken uh, perspective that the pastor is here. He's really skinny. <laughs> the pastor is right here. And his job is to spread the gospel. His job is to do the work. And then we have all the people here from his congregation, from his church. Their job, since they're paying his salary, is to let him do the work. Right? But the problem is that have you ever have you ever uh, seen those those war movies where uh, all the soldiers they line up like this against each other? What happens whenever one person steps out in front of everyone else? They get killed, right? So here's the challenge: is that the pastor isn't the one who's supposed to do the work. The Bible tells us that the pastor is called to equip people for ministry, equip the saints for ministry. The idea is that a pastor's job is to dedicate himself to make sure that you are doing exactly what God has called you and equipped you to do and empowered you to do it. Because by doing that, not only do we protect the whole body, we also accomplish more. In reality, it looks completely upside down from that. In reality... The pastor is actually here at the back. And the body is here. You see, the pastor pours into his people, his core team of leadership, make sure that they are equipped to do what God has called them to do, and then they make disciples, and they make disciples, and they make disciples. There's a a wrong thinking that somehow in Scripture that Jesus never told anybody no. That Jesus never selective about the people that he let it let into his inner circle but that's actually what happened jesus had 12 disciples but he spent more time with three of them than the others he on purpose uh cultivated this um and restricted his community here's the other thing so he uses this this uh example of a an ox not being muzzled and that a labor is worthy of his wages let me explain that so it's it was common in the ancient world uh, to whenever you are working a field, you would work it with a team of oxen and you'd have a plow behind it, right? Well, here's the challenge, is that if you're working with animals, animals are, you know, they're, they're beasts, they're living organisms, and they need to eat, right? So what happens with, with us whenever we get hungry or whenever we get hangry? We get a little upset, right? So the idea is if you're working these giant animals that are 2,500 pounds, You need to make sure that they stay on task. So how do you do that? If you're doing all this work with these animals, how do you keep them happy and how do you keep them uh, continuing to produce? Well, you can't take lunch breaks. The oxen aren't going to step off, you know, step off to the side and pull out their, you know, Avengers lunchbox, open it up and pull out their ham sandwiches. 
So instead, what you do is you don't muzzle the ox. You allow it to graze as it works. So it works the, it works the ground, and it feeds itself while it works. Number one, the farmer doesn't have to fight the animal. It sustains itself, and it doesn't get distracted. What he's saying here is that these pastors are worthy of compensation because it's dangerous for them to be distracted. Now, there is a reality that some small churches aren't able to support a pastor full-time. That is a reality. But the call, to, the call from Scripture here is that we need to be serious about what we do and how we see our pastors, that they're worthy of honor, they're worthy of double honor, they're worthy of compensation, not because we want them to be rich, but because we understand that the job that they're doing is important. Now, how does this, how does this fit in with us? Well, there's a responsibility for a church to take care of their pastors. Don't raise your hands, but I've got to ask a question. How seriously do you respect your pastors? How seriously do you, do you trust their counsel and do you seek to, uh, to, to serve and to help, help do whatever God has called you to do? Are you contributing to what God is doing here? Or are you just leeching off of the body of Christ? Are you using your pastors for free counseling? For a free sounding board? I'm not saying that you need to pay a fee to see your pastor. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm asking you to do is to challenge the, 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 the thought in your mind that somehow you're separate from the responsibility to take care of what God has called his people to do. It doesn't matter if you are babysitting and making $10 an hour or if you are making $500,000 a, a year. We have a responsibility because we need to see what God has called people to to serve the body. And whatever our portion is, that's what we give. I'm not saying that because my salary is dependent upon what you guys give in your, in your offering to the Lord. What I'm challenging you with is that I don't care what you're making, whether it's $5 or $50,000, you need to be contributing to what God is doing within a local, a local church. And it's not about anybody getting rich. It's about you taking part of what God is doing around you. We are benefiting from being a part of this community, and we need to take it seriously that we have a responsibility to do that. It's an incredibly serious and hard work for a pastor to do his job. But for the people of God, we need to understand that our pastors have been called to and take seriously the responsibility to care for them in return. The offerings that, that we make every day um, help our church, help our body to spread the gospel. We need to be a part of that. I'll never forget when I got my first job when I was 16, I got my first paycheck. And I came home and I was all excited. Mom, check this out. I got you know, a few hundred bucks. This is awesome. And she said, okay. How much of that is the Lord's? And it's not 10%. It's not 20% or 30%. It's actually all of it. The idea is that Scripture teaches us that God gives us resources to spread the gospel. God knows we need food. He knows we need a place to stay. He knows we need food. We know, he knows we need clothes for our backs. But the reality is that we need to be serious, kingdom-minded people to know that the resources that God gives us are given for a purpose, not just for our own self-indulgence. So we need to respect the call of God on our pastors. Look at these next, next few verses here. So let's talk about accountability, the respect for the call of accountability. Look at verse, verse 19. He says, do not receive an accusation against an elder except on the basis of two or three witnesses. Those who continue in sin rebuke in the presence of all so that the rest also will, fear, will be fearful of sinning. I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of, Je and of Christ Jesus and of his holy chosen angels to maintain these principles without bias, doing nothing in a spirit of partiality. Do not lay hands upon anyone too hastily and thereby share responsibility for the sins of others. Keep yourself free from sin. So think about this. First thing he says is protect pastors from false attacks um, by not allowing these accusations to come unchallenged. He talks about this thing in verses 19 and 20 about uh, two witnesses. This is actually, the, so some of you might remember 
the, the uh, encouragement from Christ in Matthew chapter 18. Remember the model of confronting someone who's fallen into sin. We go to them privately first. And we confront them and say, hey, I've noticed this about you. This is dangerous what you're doing. Please don't do this anymore. And you see if that person is going to receive that, that criticism, that, that constructive feedback. And if they don't, you go and get someone else. You, they go with you, two or three people, and you confront that person lovingly, right? If they continue to be defiant, then you take it before the elders of the church. The elders of the church hear the case from the witnesses. They issue a challenge publicly against that person. And if the person continues to be defiant, then you expel them from the body. The reason why is because a person who is not serious about their sin is a cancer for God's people. Sin is a very serious thing. Church discipline is something that is not practiced as much in most churches. And the reason why is because we're afraid to hurt people's feelings. But let me ask you a question. If you went to the doctor and the doctor said, um, you have cancer. But here's the thing. I know that surgery would be an extreme option. Granted, you've got tumors all around your body and, you know, yes, it's going to kill you eventually, but I don't want you to have to make that really hard decision. I'm, I think instead we just need to take these supplements and you'll, you'll you know, I just want to make you more comfortable. Has that doctor done his job? Absolutely not. You have freaking cancer in your body, Right? Cut it out. Change your diet. You do whatever it takes to, to starve and to kill the cancer. Same thing is true with sin in God's people. Is that a person who is making compromises in their moral compass is a liability for everybody else. The moment that someone is living rebelliously in sin and they're defiant, it affects all of the relationships around them. You guys have seen this in your, in your relationships with your friends. You've got somebody who's walking with Jesus. They're doing their thing. They get in a relationship. That relationship leads to physical intimacy. They start having sex with somebody else. What do you know? That person all of a sudden is a little volatile, a little unreasonable. Why are they so uncomfortable around me? Why are we, why are we fighting all the time? Because sin introduces conflict. And so he says, if there is going to be an issue, there should be a slow process. Now, this wasn't something new that Jesus spoke in Matthew. This is actually an old thing. This is something that God actually gave to, to Moses whenever he wrote the original Old Testament law. And the idea is this. This isn't meant to mean that we go and we, we uh, pull together a posse to go hunt down criminals and we, go make, we turn, you know, pull their arm behind their back and make them say uncle. That's not what this is about. Notice he says witnesses he doesn't say actually that we're supposed to go and get team members to go pressure people to do what we want them to do the point of this 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 it that's that's laid out in god's word both in deuteronomy and in matthew is that we're supposed to lovingly walk people out of their sin and what he's talking about with pastors here is he's saying, first you go to them in the same model and you confront them gently. But here's, what, here's how things get different with a pastor. Is that guess what? This guy right here, we're going to call him PJ. I don't know anybody named, anybody named PJ. But what happens when the person who's responsible for equipping all of these people is compromised? Now all of a sudden we have all of these people who are getting bad counsel, bad leadership, ungodly influence, right? And now all of this is at stake. Not because this person is super special, but because God has given them a place of influence. So what happens when that pastor is hunted and they fall? Everyone's affected. The whole purpose of this passage of Scripture where he says in this concept of bringing witnesses is that... Um, According to the Old Testament law, it came down to guilt. If, they, if, if somebody comes to a, a, another brother or sister in Christ and they say, hey, we've seen this in your life, this is dangerous, and you blow it off, they bring a witness with them to watch what happens the next time you bring it up. They're not coming to tag team. They're there to observe. Same, con same conversation, 
just a witness. Hey, I've noticed this is, this is happening to you. This is dangerous. We care about you together. We're not trying to tag team you. They just came along so, so we're on the same page. They rebuke again. Well, here's the thing. According to the Old Testament law, someone could not be found guilty unless there were two or more witnesses about an event. Same concept is true here. It's even more serious when a pastor makes decisions to live in rebellion because now the whole church is at stake. We've heard story after story after story of pastors not keeping their hearts with all diligence and the church crumbles because they have been attacked by the enemy and fallen into sin. How do we remedy that? He says, you go to them and you gently rebuke them. But notice he doesn't say that you gently rebuke them like they're somebody else. He says you do it in front of everyone. He goes on to say, listen, I know, Paul's telling Timothy, I know that these people are going to bring you complaints about their pastors. It comes with a job. I've had people, as lovable as I am, who don't like me. Believe it or not, that's a thing. I don't, I don't, I don't really get it, but it is a thing. You know? And so there's going to be accusations. There just are. You could be the most lovable person in the world, and people will hate your guts. Because you didn't say something nice to them, or you uh, didn't love them the way they used to be loved, or whatever. And so look at what he says in verse 21. He says, don't play favorites. He says, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus and of his chosen angels to maintain these principles without bias, doing nothing in a spirit of partiality. See, as a pastor, it's important to remember that we're accountable to God for our actions. And if a pastor plays favorites with others, it's going to undermine his credibility as a leader. He's saying, Timothy, don't let your favoritism of this pastor over this pastor over this person blind you from the truth. One of the challenges, honestly, one of the hardest challenges of being a pastor is when people are getting locked up with each other and they're getting at odds with each other is to not play favorites. Because as a, just a simple reality of being a human being, you spend t- more time with some people than you do with others. And so when there's conflict, the one that you're more familiar with, naturally, you're going to empathize with, right? But one of the challenging things is to step back and say, okay, hold up. I'm a neutral referee here. I'm not, I'm not trying to pick sides. I can't pick sides. He says, make sure that you don't do this. He says, I urge you. The language here is implying that he's saying, please, 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 please don't do this. And the reason why is because the credibility of this position is at stake. Because all of these people will be a consequence. In verse 22, he talks about uh, this same care that, that we've got to take in protecting the pulpit. Look at verse 22. He says, do not lay hands upon anyone too hastily and thereby share responsibility for, their sin, for the sins of others. Keep yourself free from sin. So check this out. Have you guys ever noticed that we, when you may have never actually asked this question, but have you ever noticed like in Christian circles, when we pray for people, we lay our hands on them? Have you guys ever thought about how weird that is? Right? It's kind of weird, right? Where does that come from? I'm, 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 well, it is nice to be touched. Solomon, you're right. <laughs> it is. Depending on who you are, some people don't like to be touched. That's the thing, you know. General rule of thumb, just so you know, a little professional advice. Don't touch anybody anytime unless they give you permission first. Period. They call it the Keanu Reeves rule. (laughs) Have you guys ever seen a picture of Keanu Reeves taking a picture with a fan? He puts his arm behind them like this, but if you notice in the pictures, homeboy is not touching anybody. His arm is like way out there. So it's like, oh, yeah, you should take a picture with me. And his hand's like way up here. (laughs) The Keanu Reeves rule, right? The idea is like if I'm going to take a picture with somebody, unless I know know them, you know, I'm not going to put my hand on them at all. Just, that's free advice. That's not in my notes at all. It's just, it's just a good practice. When in doubt, don't touch people. That's just good. So in Numbers chapter 27, here's what happens. Let's go back to this whole hands-on thing. So in Numbers chapter 27, God tells Moses it's time to to transfer ownership or, not ownership, but leadership of God's people to Joshua. So God tells Moses on purpose to bring Joshua in front of all of God's people, lay his hands on him, and bless him in front of the people of Israel. 
Essentially, what Moses was, was called to do was to commission Joshua to be the leader of all the Israelites. That's where this tradition has come from. This transitions over. What he's talking about, the laying on of hands in this verse, he's talking about what we know as ordination. Okay, Ordination is the process of, of the church recognizing that God's moving individually in the, in the life of a person, that they've been called to ministry, they've got a heart for God's, God's people, they're a shepherd. And the same thing happens here. I remember when I was ordained in 2018, one of the coolest things ever that's happened to me in my life, there was a chair in front of the, uh, the podium on the floor in the worship center right over there. And I sat in this chair, and all of the other men who have been ordained, who have been set aside for ministry, they all stood behind me. And one by one, they came behind me, and they placed their hands on my head, and they prayed for me. And they encouraged me. These are things that, that no one else heard. Some who were, clo- who were somewhat close could hear what they were saying, what they were praying. But for the most part, it was a room of 300 people that had no idea what was being said. It was one of the most powerful events of my life. What he's saying here is, be very careful to not eagerly say, oh, you've got, comp- you've got some com- competency for leadership. Oh, you've got some administrative skill. Oh, you've got uh, the gift of teaching. Okay, we're going to make you a pastor. Look at the consequence. He says, do not lay hands upon anyone too hastily and thereby share responsibility for their sins. What he's telling Timothy is he's saying, this job as a pastor that you're going to be held accountable for, that people are watching, they're going to be coming to you with complaints about these men that are under your care. He's saying, be very careful about uh, deputizing them to be pastors because if you put your stamp of approval on someone, guess what? You would put your stamp on their, their ministry and what God does in their life. James tells us in the third chapter of his book, that we should be very careful to not want to be teachers, to not want to be pastors, because we're going to be tried at a much more severe degree. The reality is that, is that God has, as he has given me a call on my life to be your shepherd, the day is going to come when I'm not just going to give an account for my life, I'm going to give an account for how I've led you, for the advice that I've given you, for the decisions that you've made as you have, as you have cultivated your life around my counsel. That's something that I carry with me. When we sit together and we talk about what's going on in your life and we open God's word and we talk about what it is, there's a reason why I only give you Bible. Because if I give you my opinion, guess whose neck is on the line? Me. So if I'm going to give you any kind of counsel, I've got to give you the word. Because if I give you anything besides the word, I'm giving you my opinion. And the challenge is that if you make decisions based on the counsel that I give you and it's not rooted in God's word, guess who bears the responsibility for that counsel? Me. He says, be very careful that you don't hastily just jump into this. Allow other people to jump into this because we've got a responsibility to protect people from jumping in front of the firing squad about being this guy right here. I know it's exciting to see people in our community that, that have God has risen up to be pastors and to be, to be ministry leaders. But when that happens, guys, you need to pray for them. You need to get on your knees and you need to pray that God would protect them. I ask you for me, if you can do anything for me, pray for me. If you can do anything for Taylor, pray for Taylor. Because the weight is heavy. When we meet and we talk about your life, it is not just something where we give free advice and we're, we're happy to have those conversations. Those things are extremely heavy. I can't tell you how many nights I lay there in bed awake with my head on my pillow and I think about you. Paul writes in the scriptures, he, he talks about the letters to the churches, and he says, I long to see you. I care about you so much. I think about you all the time, and I pray for you. Because the toll of being a pastor is so heavy. This, this respect for accountability is something that we take very seriously. And it's not just for, for um, accountability is not just for lay people in the church. This is something that is heavy for your pastors. It's for everyone. And see, as, as we work together to spread the gospel and we challenge each other in godliness, we need to remember that pastors need help just like everyone else. God's chosen to dedicate us to equipping believers for ministry through training in God's word. 
And if we compromise, generations of people are going to be affected. There are a lot of stories of pastors who make stupid decisions and they hurt people. And guess what? Those hurt people go on to hurt more people and they go on to hurt more people. I met a young adult just a few months ago who um, he and his family were attending a church here in town. A church that prescribed to what's the, what's called the pr- prosperity gospel. That God wants you to have whatever it is that will make you happy. That you just need to pray for it. You need to claim it and God's going to give it to you. Well, the only challenge is that pastor got sick. And that theology is built around this idea that if, if I have enough faith, I'm going to be fine. I'm going to be, I'm going to be healed. What happens when the pastor dies? This young adult's family was shattered, and his parents have not been in church for over five years. The challenge is that we have to be very, very careful about this accountability. Now, naturally, this is going to be heavy for Timothy, right? He's thinking about, oh, I'm in charge of all these things. This is is really, really heavy. So what do you do with that? Well, check out these last couple of verses. Look at verse 23. He says, No longer drink water exclusively, but use a little wine for the sake of your stomach and for your frequent uh, ailments. The sins of some men are quite evident, going going before them to judgment. For others, their sins sins follow after. Likewise also, deeds that are good are quite evident, and those which are otherwise cannot be concealed. Let's talk about this uh, respect for liberty. He says leaders need to take care of themselves. Now, church history tells us, and we have a little bit of clues here in Scripture, that Timothy had an issue. His body wasn't quite working right. He had some issue going on with his digestive system. His stomach or his, something was happening internally, and so he was a man who was prone to sickness. And so Paul is, is giving him some encouragement. He's, he's telling him to take care of himself. Now, there are some people who take, take verse 23 and they say, oh, this means that we can, you know, we can drink alcohol. We can do whatever we want, Right? We've already talked about alcohol before. There's nothing in Paul's, in Paul's letters to the church that say that alcohol is, is ultimately a, uh, anything other than a gift that God's given us, if it's used responsibly, just like anything else. We already, we've already seen that, that his, his uh, qualifications for overseers or for deacons or for, or for pastors is that they need, they, these need to be people who are appropriate in, in their lifestyles. They're not drunkards. They're not alcoholics. These are men who take their job seriously, their holiness seriously, not, not just because they're pastors, but because they want to honor God with their lives. So we know that that's not what he's talking about here. So the context tells us that, that he's turning to, to Timothy and he's saying, hey, I know you're busy taking care of all these people, but remember to take care of yourself. For thousands of years, alcohol has been a medicinal thing. Something that people take when they're sick, people that things that it's something that people take when they are they're not feeling well it is a medicine uh, in fact scripture has um, has teaching about about alcohol being medicine it's a remedy for sickness it's not it's not for entertainment what he's telling Timothy here is he's saying hey you need to take some time for yourself you need to be careful about uh, overextending yourself and and uh, and working yourself too hard but then he offers this, this guidance here in verses 24 and 25, and he says, The sins of some men are quite evident, going before them to judgment. For others, their sins follow after. Think about this. He's, he's saying that the, the people that are under your care, you bear responsibility for them, you, you're supposed to lead them, you're supposed to guide them. What Paul is saying here is he's saying, look, some people's sin is obvious. It really is. It's obvious. You can see it a mile away. But sin is sin. Not all sin is obvious. Some, some sin is, uh, is hidden. So some people, when they get to heaven, or when they get to the judgment seat of, of, of God, their reputation is going to precede them. And everyone's going to know, oh, well, we know why they're here. Because who they were as a person. But to that one person who, or to those people who think that they can just kind of coast and nobody really knows about the rebellion against God, it's going to happen. Because he will bring everything into light, both the good and the evil. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 14. These are the last words that that King Solomon wrote in his life. At the end of his life, the wisest man in the world, in the history of the world, sits down. He puts to pen to paper and he says this. He says, let us hear the, the full extent of everything. 
Uh, what is man to do? For God will bring every act to judgment, everything which is hidden, whether it is good or evil. These things in these last couple of verses are reminders to Timothy to keep things in perspective. He's not supposed to be a super pastor. He needs to take care of himself and trust that God will be the proper judge. One of the things that has been the most profound that I have learned while being in ministry, I listened to a lesson years ago by an old, uh, by an old teacher who wasn't even a pastor. And he said every pastor should have a graveyard in the back of their mind. And what they do is that in the graveyard, they take the things that are told to them in confidence, the heavy things in life, abuse and hard conversations and hard relationships and difficulty, to take those things and to bury them in the graveyard that no one knows about. There are things that I carry that even my wife doesn't know. She knows. She said, she, she'll ask me, where were you, wh- you know, what were you doing tonight? Why were you out late? I was having a graveyard conversation. Okay. And she knows that things are being buried in the graveyard. What Paul's telling Timothy here is he's saying, look, you don't have to carry everything. Your job is not to carry everything for every bun because God is going to be the one who brings everything into the light. We can walk in confidence in that. He's reassuring him that God is going to be both his judge now and also for eternity. Timothy was in a difficult environment in Ephesus. He was working with some broken people that had real issues. We need to remember that in the course of ministry, our responsibility is to lead others well, um, that we need to be firmly, firmly established in the freedom of Christ and the security of the gospel. That means that no matter how distracted people get with sin, we need to remember that we serve an almighty God who is the judge. Our job is not to be the police and make sure our friends are doing everything that we think that they should be doing. Our job is to stay consistent with what God has called us to do. Our job is not to live perfectly without sin, but to perfectly live in the freedom of the gospel. And so, last three questions. Anytime we read God's word, we need to ask these three things. What does this teach us about God? What does this teach us about man? And what do we do with it? So, what does this passage teach us about God? It teaches us that He loves His family so much that He dedicated caretakers for it. Think about it this way. Pastors are the white blood cells of the body. White blood cells fight infection. The job is to go and keep the the body healthy, no matter what the infection might be. To seize it and and to offer a solution. It also tells us that God sees all members of his body as important and holds them all accountable, including his pastors. There are no favorites. That he cares about us enough to reveal every part of our lives, both good and bad. That is actually a comforting thing. If you have held a sin, if you've hidden a sin, if you've hidden uh, decisions in your life that you know are not honoring to God, it's exhausting to live in that lie. It's exhausting to not be able to be real, to be the person that you say that you are. What does this teach us about ourselves, about us? It teaches us that we need caretakers in our lives. That means that we need to honor them for what God has asked of them. When you think of your pastors, I'm not saying this just for me, but when you think of your pastors and you think of the way that they love you, you need to not take that lightly. You need to pray for them. You need to care for them. And you need to realize that you cannot do this without help. It's not because we're super smart. It's because... God has made us the white blood cells of the body. And so what that means is that if you have issues that you can't can't figure out, that your community is struggling to understand, you come to your pastors and you ask for help. And you trust that they want the best for you. Now, I understand that there are people that that take that authority and that responsibility and they abuse it. They will be held accountable by God for what they have done. But that doesn't change the truth of God's word here. It also teaches us that we need accountability no matter who we are in the body. I need accountability just like you do. There are guys on our staff, A.J. Gonzalez is one of them. He holds me accountable. We're logged into each other's Instagram accounts. We hold each other accountable in our conversations, in our relationships. We make sure that we're watching each other's back because we want to make sure that we're safe because we are the men right here. We know that if, if the Satan gets to us, then he gets to all of you. There are a hundred more students in the student ministry that are at stake, and so we submit ourselves to accountability no matter who we are. 
And finally, it teaches us that we can't hide from God. You might think that you can. You might think that you can coast, you can do whatever you want, because it doesn't matter what you do in your bedroom at night on your phone. It doesn't matter what you do in privacy with your significant other. But all things will come to the light. So what do we do with these things? The first is we contribute to the work of the church. If you're not giving regularly to the church from your income, I'm going to tell you in love that you are not doing what God has called you to do because you're taking advantage of God's people. He tells us clearly in this passage of Scripture that we are meant to be contributing to what God is doing in our body. That is something that is an absolute. The second thing I want you to encourage you is to hold each other accountable. That you need to be looking for ways that, you're, that you can encourage your friends in godliness. It is not enough. You're not going out there trying to make sure everybody's following the rules. You're looking for cancer. You do it in a, in a, in a, in a spirit of love. We say this all the time. We want to be a scalpel, not a cleaver. Right? It's the difference between a butcher and a surgeon. A butcher doesn't care. They're just lopping things off, right? But a surgeon is going to do the minimum amount of damage for the maximum amount of healing. We want to deal with cancer and we want to do it gently. And the last thing is that we need to honor God with our life. If he has gone to such lengths to protect us and to provide a, 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 a reinforcement and an in a accountability structure around us to keep us safe and to keep us strong, We need to honor him with how we're living our lives. That means we need to be sanctified. We need to be set apart. We need to be holy. We need to take our our roles seriously because what we do in the private places of our life is going to change the lives of others around us, whether whether we want to believe that or not. So here's my final encouragement to you. God has given me the privilege of being your pastor, of being of being. Uh, the person in closest proximity to you. I want to encourage you in this. To see your place in what God is doing here. This is not about Philip teaching you what you need to know to live your life. I want you to be thinking about how are you pouring into what God is doing here broadly. Who has God called you to be in in the REACH ministry? You're not just a consumer How are you contributing? How are you being a part of what God's doing? When strangers come in, when new people come in, are you seeking them out? Are you being their friend? Are you introducing them around, making sure they have something to eat, something to drink? Are you a warm face? Are you someone who is a good student of the word? When your friends come to you and they need help, do you give them truth? Or are you coasting? I want to ask yourself that. A servant is first and foremost a good steward. And a steward knows their business. God has a place for you and what he's doing in this community. And I don't want you to miss it. Hey guys, this is Philip Jackson, pastor of Young Adults at Evergreen Baptist Church. I want to invite you to come to REACH. We meet every Tuesday night at 7 p.m. at Evergreen Church in South Tulsa, just east of Mingo on 111th Street. The mission of Reach Tulsa is to cultivate a young adult community that's defined by real transformation and a sincere pursuit of a godly life through training in biblical disciplines, personal development, and intentionally transitioning into independence as mature members of the body of Christ. If you enjoyed this episode, please be sure to like and subscribe to our content. We're available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Reach Young Adult Ministry is a part of Evergreen Baptist Church in Tulsa, Oklahoma. For more information and additional lessons, please visit our website, evergreenbc.org.